Chapter Four of Don O'Hara, The Girl Who Laughed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Don O'Hara, The Girl Who Laughed by Edna Ferber. Chapter Four Don Develops a Heim V. It's hard trying to develop into a real writer lady in the bosom of one's family, especially when the family refuses to take one seriously. Seven years of newspaper grind have taught me the fallacy of trying to write by the inspiration method. But there is such a thing as a train of thought, and mine is constantly being derailed and wrecked and pitched about. Scarcely am I settled in my cubbyhole, typewriter before me, the working plan of a story buzzing about in my brain, when I hear my name called in muffled tones, as though the speaker were laboring with a mouthful of hairpins. I pay no attention. I have just given my heroine a pair of calm gray eyes, shaded with black lashes and hair to match. A voice floats down from the upstairs regions. "'Don! Oh, Don! Just run and rescue the cucumbers out of the top of the ice box, will you? The ice man's coming, and he'll squash em. A parting jab at my heroine's hair and eyes, and I'm off to save the cucumbers. Back at my typewriter once more. Shall I make my heroine petite or grande? I decide that stateliness and Gibson-esque height should accompany the calm gray eyes. I rattle away happily, the plot unfolding itself in some mysterious way. Sis opens the door a little and peers in. She is dressed for the street. Don, dear, I'm going to the dressmaker's. Frida's upstairs cleaning the bathroom, so take a little squint at the roast now and then, will you? See that it doesn't burn and that there's plenty of gravy. Oh, and Don, tell the milkman we want an extra half pint of cream today. The tickets are on the kitchen shelf, back of the clock. I'll be back in an hour. Hm, I reply. Sis shuts the door, but opens it again almost immediately. Don't let the infants bother you, but if Frida's upstairs and they come to you for something to eat, don't let them have any cookies before dinner. If they're really hungry, they'll eat bread and butter. I promise, dreamily, my last typewritten sentence still running through my head, the gravy seems to have got into the heroine's calm gray eyes. What heroine could remain calm-eyed when her creator's mind is filled with roast beef? A half hour elapses before I get back on the track. Then appears the hero, a tall blond youth, fair to behold. I make him two yards high and endow him with a pair of clothing advertisement shoulders. There assails my nostrils a fearful smell of scorching. The roast. A wild rush into the kitchen. I fling open the oven door. The roast is mahogany-colored and gravyless. It takes fifteen minutes of the most desperate first aid to the injured measures before the roast is revived. Back to the writing. It has lost its charm. The gray-eyed heroine is a stick. She moves like an Indian lady outside a cigar shop. The hero is a milk-and-water sissy without a vital spark in him. What's the use of trying to write anyway? Nobody wants my stuff. Good for nothing except dubbing on a newspaper. Rap, rap, rapity, rap, rap, bing, milk. I dash into the kitchen. No milk, no milkman. I fly to the door. He is disappearing around the corner of the house. Hi, Mr. Milkman. Say, Mr. Milkman, with frantic beckonings. He turns. He lifts up his voice. The screen door was locked, so I left you your milk on top of the icebox on the back porch. Thought like the hired girl was upstairs and I could get the tickets tomorrow. I explain about the cream, adding that it is wanted for shortcake. The explanation does not seem to cheer him. He appears to be a very gloomy and reserved milkman. I fancy that he is in the habit of indulging in a little airy persiflage with Frida o' mornings, and he finds me a poor substitute for her red-cheeked comeliness. The milk safely stowed away in the ice-box, I have another look at the roast. I am dipping up spoonfuls of brown gravy and pouring them over the surface of the roast in approved basting style, when there is a rush, a scramble, and two hard bodies precipitate themselves upon my legs so suddenly that for a moment my head pitches forward into the oven. I withdraw my head from the oven hastily. The basting spoon is immersed in the bottom of the pan. I turn indignant. The spalpeens look up at me with innocent eyes. You little devils! What do you mean by shoving your old aunt into the oven? It's cannibals you are. The idea pleases them. They release my legs and execute a savage war dance around me. 
The Spalpeens are firm in the belief that I was brought to their home for their sole amusement, and they refuse to take me seriously. The Spalpeens themselves are two of the finest examples of real humor that ever were perpetrated upon parents. Sheila is the firstborn. Nora decided that she should be an Irish beauty, and bestowed upon her a name that reeks of the bogs. Whereupon Sheila, at the age of six, is as flaxen-haired and blue-eyed and stolid a little German mansion as ever fooled her parents, and she is a feminine reproduction of her German dad. Two years later came a sturdy boy, and they named him Hans, in a flaunt of defiance. Hans is black-haired, gray-eyed, and Irish as Killarney. "'We're awful hungry,' announces Sheila. "'Can't you wait until dinner-time? Such a grand dinner!' Sheila and Hans roll their eyes to convey to me that, were they to wait until dinner for sustenance, we should find but their lifeless forms. Well, then, Auntie will get a nice piece of bread and butter for each of you. Don't want bread and butty, shrieks Hans. Want tookie. Cookie, echoes Sheila, pounding on the kitchen table with a rescued basting spoon. You can't have cookies before dinner. They're bad for your insides. Can, too, disputes Hans. Fuida gives us tookies. Want tookie, wailingly. Please, please, Auntie Donny, dearie, wheedles Sheila, wriggling her soft little fingers in my hand. But Mother never lets you have cookies before dinner, I retort severely. She knows they are bad for you. Pooh, she does, too. She always says, no, not a cookie, and then we beg and screech, and then she says, oh, for pity's sake, Frida, give him a cookie and send him out. One cookie can't kill him. Sheila's imitation is delicious. Hans catches the word screech and takes it as his cue. He begins a series of ear-piercing wails. Sheila surveys him with pride, and then takes the wail up in a minor key. Their teamwork is marvelous. I fly to the cookie jar and extract two round and sugary confections. I thrust them into the pink, eager palms. The wails cease. Solemnly they place one cookie atop the other, measuring the circlets with grave eyes. "'Mine's a weeny bit bigger than yours this time,' decides Sheila and holds her cookie heroically, while Hans takes a just and lawful bite out of his sister's larger share. The blessed little angels, I say to myself, melting, the dear unselfish little sweeties, and give each of them another cookie. Back to my typewriter. But the words flatly refuse to come now. I make six false starts, bite all my best fingernails, screw my hair into a wilderness of corkscrews, and give it up. No doubt a real lady writer could write on, unruffled and unhearing, while the ice man squashed the cucumbers and the roast burned to a frazzle, and the spalpeens perished of hunger. Possessed of the real spark of genius, trivialities like milkmen and cucumbers could not dim its glow. Perhaps all successful lady writers with real live sparks have cooks and scullery maids, and need not worry about basting and gravy and milkmen. This book writing is all very well for those who have a large faith in the future and an equally large bank account but my future will have to be hand-carved, and my bank account has always been an all-too-small pay envelope at the end of each week. It will be months before the book is shaped and finished, and my pocketbook is empty. Last week Max sent money for the care of Peter. He and Nora think that I do not know. Von Gerhard was here in August. I told him that all my firm resolutions to forsake newspaperdom forever were slipping away one by one. I have heard of the fascination of the newspaper office he said in his understanding way. I believe you have a heimvee for it, not? Heimvee. That's the word, I had agreed. After you have been a newspaper writer for seven years and loved it, you will be a newspaper writer at heart and by instinct at least until you die. There's no getting away from it. It's in the blood. Newspaper men have been known to inherit fortunes, to enter politics, to write books and become famous, to degenerate into press agents and become infamous, to blossom into personages, to sink into non-entities, but their news nose remained a part of them, and the inky, smoky, stuffy smell of the newspaper office was ever sweet in their nostrils. But, not yet, von Gerhard had said, it unless you want to have again this miserable business of the sick nurse. Wait yet a few months. And so I have waited, saying nothing to Nora and Max, but I want to be in the midst of things. I miss the sensation of having my fingers at the pulse of the big old world. I'm lonely for the noise and the rush and the hard work for a glimpse of the busy local room just before press time, when the lights are swimming in a smoky haze, and the big presses downstairs are thundering their warning to hurry, and the men are breezing in from their runs with the grist of news that will be ground finer and finer as it passes through the mill of copy-readers and editors' hands. I want to be there in the thick of the confusion that is, 
after all so orderly. I want to be there when the telephone bells are zinging, and the typewriters are snapping, and the messenger boys are shuffling in and out, and the office kids are scuffling in a corner, and the big city editor, collar off, sleeves rolled up from his great arms, hair bristling wildly above his green eye-shade, is swearing gently and smoking cigarette after cigarette, lighting each fresh one at the dying glow of the last. I would give a year of my life to hear him say, I don't mind telling you, Beatrice Fairfax, that that was a darn good story you got on the Millhop divorce. The other fellow's having a word that isn't rehash. All of which is most unwomanly, for is not marriage woman's highest aim, and home her true sphere? Haven't I tried both? I ought to know. I merely have been miscast in this life's drama. My part should have been that of one who makes her way alone. Peter, with his thin, cruel lips, and his shaking hands, and his haggard face, and his smoldering eyes, is a shadow forever blotting out the sunny places in my path. I was meant to be an old maid like the terrible old Kitty O'Hara, not one of the tatting and tea kind, but an impressive, bustling old girl with a double chin. The sharp-tongued Kitty O'Hara used to say that being an old maid was a great deal like death by drowning, a really delightful sensation when you cease struggling. Nora has pleaded with me to be more like other women of my age, and for her sake I've tried. She has led me about to bridge parties and tea fights, and I have tried to act as though I were enjoying it all, but I knew that I wasn't getting on a bit. I have come to the conclusion that one year of newspapering counts for two years of ordinary existence, and that while I'm twenty-eight in the family Bible, I'm fully forty inside. When one day may bring under one's pen a priest, a pauper, a prostitute, a philanthropist, each with a story to tell, and each requiring to be bullied or cajoled or bribed or threatened or tricked into telling it, then the end of that day's work finds one looking out at the world with eyes that are very tired and as old as the world itself. I'm spoiled for sewing bees and church sociables and afternoon bridges. A hunger for the city is upon me. The long, lazy summer days have slipped by. There is an autumn tang in the air. The breeze has a touch that is sharp. Winter in a little northern town. I should go mad. But winter in the city. The streets at dusk on a frosty evening. The shop windows arranged by artist hands for the beauty-loving eyes of women. The rows of lights like jewels strung on an invisible chain. The glitter of brass and enamel as the endless procession of motors flashes past. The smartly gowned women. The keen-eyed nervous men. The shrill note of the crossing policeman's whistle every smoke-grimed wall and pillar taking on a mysterious shadowy beauty in the purple dusk, every unsightly blot obscured by the kindly night. But best of all, the fascination of the people I'd like to know. They pop up now and then in the shifting crowds and are gone the next moment, leaving behind them a vague regret. Sometimes I call them the people I'd like to know, and sometimes I call them the people I know I'd like, but it means much the same. Their faces flash by in the crowd and are gone, but I recognize them instantly as belonging to my beloved circle of unknown friends. Once it was a girl opposite me in a car, a girl with a wide, humorous mouth and tragic eyes and a hole in her shoe. Once it was a big, homely, red-headed giant of a man with an engineering magazine sticking out of his coat pocket. He was standing at a book counter reading Dickens like a schoolboy and laughing in all the right places, I know, because I peeked over his shoulder to see. Another time it was a sprightly little grizzled old woman staring into a dazzling shop window in which was displayed a wonderful collection of fashionably impossible hats and gowns. She was dressed all in rusty black, was the little old lady, and she had a quaint cast in her left eye that gave her the oddest, most sporting look. The cast was working overtime as she gazed at the gowns, and the ridiculous old sprigs on her rusty black bonnet trembled with her silent mirth. She looked like one of those clever, epigrammatic, dowdy old duchesses that one reads about in English novels. I'm sure she had cardamom seeds in her shabby bag, and a carriage with a crest on it waiting for her just around the corner. I ached to slip my hand through her arm and ask her what she thought of it all. I know that her reply would have been exquisitely witty and audacious, and I did so long to hear her say it. No doubt some good angel tugs at my common sense, restraining me from doing these things that I am tempted to do. Of course it would be madness for a woman to address unknown red-headed men with the look of an engineer about them and a book of Dickens in their hands, or perky old women with nutcracker faces, or girls with wide humorous mouths. Oh, it couldn't be done, I suppose. They would clap me in a padded cell in no time if I were to say, Mr. Red-headed man, I'm so glad your heart is young enough for Dickens. I love him, too, enough to read him standing at a book counter in a busy shop. And do you know, I like the squareness of your jaw, and the way your eyes crinkle up when you laugh. 
and as for your being an engineer, why, one of the very first men I ever loved was the engineer in Soldiers of Fortune. I wonder what the girl in the car would have said if I had crossed over to her and put my hand on her arm and spoken thus. Girl with the wide humorous mouth and the tragic eyes and the hole in your shoe, I think you must be an awfully good sort. I'll wager you paint, or write, or act, or do something clever like that for a living. But from that hole in your shoe, which you have inked so carefully, although it persists in showing white at the seams, I fancy you are stumbling over a rather stony bit of life's road just now. And from the look in your eyes, girl, I'm afraid the stones have cut and bruised rather cruelly. But when I look at your smiling, humorous mouth, I know that you are trying to laugh at the hurts. I think that this morning, when you inked your shoe for the dozenth time, you hesitated between tears and laughter, and the laugh won, thank God. Please keep right on laughing, and don't you dare stop for a minute, because pretty soon you'll come to a smooth, easy place, and then won't you be glad that you didn't give up to lie down by the roadside, weary of your hurts? Oh, it would never do, never, and yet no charm possessed by the people I know and like can compare with the fascination of those people I'd like to know and know I would like. Here at home with Nora there are no faces in the crowds. There are no crowds. When you turn the corner at Main Street you are quite sure that you will see the same people in the same places. You know that Mamie Hayes will be flapping her duster just outside the door of the jewelry store where she clerks. She gazes up and down Main Street as she flaps the cloth, her bright eyes keeping a sharp watch for stray traveling men that may chance to be passing. You know that there will be the same lounging group of white-faced, vacant-eyed youths outside the pool room. Dr. Briggs's patient runabout will be standing at his office doorway. Outside his butcher shop, Assemblyman Schenck will be holding forth on the subject of county politics to a group of red-faced, badly-dressed, prosperous-looking farmers and townsmen, and as he talks, a circle of brown tobacco juice which surrounds the group closes in upon them, nearer and nearer. And there, in a roomy chair in a corner of the public library reference room, facing the big front window, you will see old man Randall. His white hair forms a halo above his pitiful drink-marred face. He was to have been a great lawyer, was old man Randall, but on the road to fame he met drink, and she grasped his arm and led him down byways and into crooked lanes and finally into ditches, and he never arrived at his goal. There in that library window nook it is cool in summer and warm in winter. So he sits and dreams, holding an open volume, unread, on his knees. Sometimes he writes, hunched up in his corner, feverishly scribbling at ridiculous plays, short stories, and novels, which later he will insist on reading to the tittering schoolboys and girls who come into the library to do their courting and reference work. Presently, when it grows dusk, old man Randall will put away his book, throw his coat over his shoulders, sleeves dangling, flowing white locks sweeping the frayed velvet collar. He will march out with his soldierly tread, humming a bit of a tune down the street and into Vandermeister's saloon, where he will beg a drink and a lunch, and some man will give it to him for the sake of what old man Randall might have been. All these things you know, and knowing them, what is left for the imagination? How can one dream dreams about people, when one knows how much they pay their hired girl, and what they have for dinner on Wednesdays? End of chapter 4